Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 5th, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And if you're watching recording, thank you very much, too. Um, by the way, if you are a member of DaveLander.com, what I have been doing is making the unedited version available so you don't have to wait for it. That date's wrong, obviously. So current market conditions, the beginning of the end. And there are a couple of sell signals that I'm gonna walk you through. Same thing that I think I walked you through last week, maybe an additional one. Kind of interesting development that we actually got a longer term sell signal, the TFM 10% system, which is a weekly sell signal. We got that before we got a bow tie sell signal, which actually has not triggered as of late, but it could soon. We'll get into all that. Your question on trading, uh, your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides. And then when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. Also, when we get to the live charts, you can ask about your favorite stock picks. One at a time, if you don't mind, and that's just for your benefit. In other words, type in your symbol and then hit return. And that way, I know which ones I covered and which ones that I didn't. So I'm sort of going to continue on with what I've been doing. But I also want to talk a lot about surviving or drawdown and surviving a market turn and understanding markets and kind of roll that all in. Because a lot of people are kind of freaking out, not you guys, because you guys here today, you've been through all this before and you know how the, the, the game works. And it sucks, don't get me wrong, I don't wanna minimize it, but uh, I was thinking before this, it's like last week or so, I was kind of, I was probably downright depressed if the truth be told about everything but now that i'm in the middle of writing it out it's like i'm actually getting a little bit more philo philosophical especially when people are like calling me up and freaking out it's like well geez you didn't have a plan to begin with and it makes me realize how important it is to have a plan and then how important it is to see both sides of the market and so on and so forth and i'm gonna flesh all that out in just one second here there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or i was off to summon up all predictions are about the future yeah, a lot of stuff can have between now and then. And I stole that line from Greg Morris. So this is something I talked about yesterday in the Trading Simplified show over at Stock Charts. And I thought it'd be good to talk about it here too. I'm getting a few emails about what to do with XYZ. And my question is what was your original plan and obviously you didn't have one now the new me or over the last 10 years the new me i noticed especially when i started putting together my members area it's like i've been pretty inefficient in all this one-on-one -on -one interaction that i've done with you guys over the years and i've enjoyed doing that believe me but i've suffered from it as far as repetitive injuries and already had one surgery and might even have Two or three more if I'm that careful. I'm literally wearing two braces now. That's one reason I didn't put the camera on. I don't want to look like an idiot wearing all these braces and shit. <laughs> but, you know, I've been a little inefficient, I think, in my teaching. And I'm trying to fix that with the Facebook group by getting a bunch of us together. And in addition to that, the learning management system. So we have all the information there. And anything we're missing... We're going to fill in the blanks and fill in the holes with the Q&A. And you guys have been gracious enough to help some of the newbies out in the group. And for that, I'm, I'm very thankful. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is not to pour salt in anyone's wounds that's getting hurt. And believe me, I'm getting hurt, too. And I'll show you how bad in just one second, at least a snapshot of a piece of how bad. It's actually much worse than what I'm going to show you. And I'll explain that in one second, too. But the point I have, believe it or not, I do have one, is that, okay, so you screwed up this time, that's life. Just get educated for the next time and have some sort of plan in place. And be careful not to get caught up in the buy and hold Kool-Aid. And that can happen on individual issues. I've got one client in particular has been holding Apple forever, but he had no plan to sell. And other people over the recently more recent times until it started going down it's like why don't we just buy apple and hold on it's like well just because it's going up doesn't mean it will always go up and you have to have a plan in place for every asset as you'll see in one second now 
as I said yesterday, it's like I read somewhere on the internet, you know, you middle-aged guys stop quoting Sun Tzu. But there's a lot of good stuff in Sun Tzu, and that's the art of war. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend you read it. A lot of it applies to trading. In times of peace, plan for war. So when things are going swimmingly, just remember that they won't always go swimmingly, as I'm going to point out in one minute. I know your eyes are probably glazing over as I say this. Markets go up and markets go down. Now, as I preach, all trades eventually end badly, especially if you are a trend follower. And by the way, the only way to make money is to what? Capture a trend. So you have to have a solid money management plan in place. Now, Apple seems to be everybody's darling stock, and this stock could do no wrong. Well, until it does, I guess. And it looks like Apple is cracked for now. And what I was pointing out yesterday is Apple has formed a bow tie sell signal. Your entry would be at 277. A little bit more aggressive entry would be to follow it higher, maybe about 285 or so. Again, it's a little retrace that's happening. Now, and the reason I'm showing Apple is because I'm getting questions on Apple. It's like, well, what was your original plan? Where were you going to stop out? Were you going to ride this thing all the way down to zero? Now, people think Apple could do no wrong, but go go back in history, and Apple loses occasionally 40 or 50 percent of its value. So, if you're going to buy a shit ton of Apple, be be prepared to occasionally lose half of your money. And have a sell area in mind. Have an exit in mind. Don't sit around and wait for a sell signal like this one to occur. Now, the other big question is, what should I do with my investments? Well, first off, there are no good investments. I would love if there was something that I could put my money into, and it would just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. But as I often preach, and I don't know who said it first, but all asset classes will lose half of their value at some point in your lifetime. And I could think of, well, go through all the commodities. Many commodities have halved in value since I've been on this planet. I've seen silver half in value, more than half in value, because I saw the bubble many, many years ago, and I saw that pop. Cocoa has <laughs> lost half its value a while back. And I actually made a lot of presentations about that. And it's like, hey, how stressful was that cocoa bear market? Well, not, not stressful at all, because most of you didn't trade the cocoa bear market. So all investments, including stocks, and then look, look back, what was it, 2008, real estate lost half its value. I, I knew that real estate would be in trouble when people got fed up with the stock market and said, oh, I'm just going to invest in real estate now. It's like, oh, geez, here we go again. Now, I would encourage you to study some simple market timing systems. It doesn't have to be my stuff. In fact, I give away my market timing, and I'm going to show you one simple little system now that I think does a pretty good job keeping you on the right side of the market. But more importantly, it keeps you from having that diaper change moment of losing half or more of your investment. Keep in mind, market timing is freaking tough. Make no bones about it. You will get whipsawed on occasion, that I can guarantee. As Greg Morris says, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So make no bones about it. Market timing is not that easy. Just look at the number of fund managers who cannot beat the S&P 500. The question you should ask yourself is where will you get out? Knowing that might be the exact bottom. Knowing that the market, as I'm going to beat the dead horse on in just one second, is a bad teacher. But you have to have some point where you're going to get out of the way. The other problem is where will you get back in? A few years ago, a buddy of mine was freaking out a little bit. And I said, hey, learn about these systems, study the market. And I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. But he he's like into stuff, man. He gets into something. He just latches on and doesn't let go, and he studies it and studies it and spends time and money and effort, and he becomes obsessed with things. And I'm like, you know, just take a fraction of the amount of time you are spending researching these things that you're so gung-ho about, 
and just learn a little bit about how markets work, that markets go up and markets go down. And he didn't do that. So it's like he was asking me what I thought about the market. I told him the market wasn't looking so hot. This was back in December of 2018. So he got out, but he didn't have a plan to get back in. So if you do get out, I never thought about that problem. The problem is you have to be willing to get back in and you have to decide where you're going to get in. <laughs> I use the genius indicator. Is that from the genius prayer? Combined with stock tips from my brother is a done deal. Yeah. Yeah. When certain people begin to tell you how smart they are about the stocks, then you need to run. And when you get a log into YouTube and you get the sweaty guy in the basement du jour telling you how easy trading is, and that's trading is, that's usually about the time when, when it's done. Cash is also an asset class and can lose value during inflation. Yeah, it can, James. And I agree with you on that. I'm actually going to mention you as somebody who times the market. Can I use your full name? If not, I'll just use your first name. There it is. I knew I had it in here somewhere. Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. I've quoted Greg many a times. He actually told me that when he was visiting a while back. And then I later found out he's written it before in blogs and other places. Now, I know I beat the dead horse on this, but once again, we've been provided with a lot of examples of how the market is a bad teacher. And I'm a man on the street kind of guy. And a couple of years ago, I was writing a U-Haul and a guy I had on CNBC and I told him I dabbled in the markets and he kind of rolled his eyes at me and I didn't, you know, <laughs> fine. I don't want to have to, you know, get into a long conversation. And he said, man, I'm glad I didn't sell in December. I wish I would have bought more. And I had to bite my tongue because I was thinking that'll work until it don't. It'll come back. Guy in the gym I was talking to recently, a little upset about losing some of his investments and all this slide. I'm like, oh, geez, not a good thing. And then uh, confusing the issue with facts and trying to connect the dots with news was another thing that I'm seeing, especially lately. It's just the insert the news event here. Now, I will think the markets will survive this particular news event longer term. I want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but you can't blame the market slide on one particular thing and then hope that thing goes away. And it just gets too complicated when it, when it's, when you're trying to make that logical argument. And I did a really good piece on my website, at least I think I just kind of cranked it out real quick. Like, where are we now? And the fact that people are trying to put logic to all this, which doesn't necessarily work. And again, the market is a bad teacher. Now, I told the people yesterday in stock charts, it's like, you know, you guys have a secret weapon as members of stockcharts.com, or if you have a charting package like Telechart, you have a secret weapon. Go in and look at the charts. Now, this is straight from the column I did recently, just a quick little market update. But keep in mind, and, and I've had people laugh in my face before, and I just that's why I just try to avoid talking too much about the markets and cocktail parties. But I said, you know, it can go 52 years or more. 52 years. It might go 52 years. Who knows? A market can go 25 years or more without making new highs. And they just laugh at me because they drink the Kool-Aid that the market always goes up. So using your little secret weapon of charts, take a look at the S&P, peak the trough, in 2007 to 2009, it lost 57% of its value. That's more than half, okay? You're thinking about retiring 2007, 2008, 2009 rolls around, unless you have a huge amount of money to where half of it's fine to live off of, you're going to be a hurting pup. And if you had a huge amount of money, losing over half of that, 60% of it, it's pretty painful. Obviously, go back to 2000. I realize I'm preaching to the choir, but when friends and other people contact me because they're freaking out, well, you have to study the markets. You have to know that markets go up and markets go down. As I often joke, when you tell people that, they look at you like you pooed your pants. Same, same expression you get, as I often say. If you walk to a Starbucks and ask for a cup of coffee, you know? So that was 2000, obviously 2007, the beginning of the bear market there. Another 50% haircut, 2000, 50% haircut. And yeah, that's a slide that I didn't put in 
I was I went into YouTube and I did a lot of good presentations and I wish I'd have thought about doing this earlier because I ran out of time this morning. But I've done quite a few what I think are good presentations on what to do in a bear market and and surviving a drawdown and things like that on things of that nature. And yeah, as Craig is pointing out, it takes 100% gain to make back a 50% loss. And if you go further below 50%, then it grows geometrically. You, I think a 90% a loss takes, what, 900% to make back or something like that? So, something ridiculous. So yeah, surviving a drawdown is key. I went back to the 70s and look back all the way to the 50s and from late 50s to mid 70s there's been a few zigs and zags in between obviously but if you held on through the entire period there was a zero percent return and lo and behold there also was a 50 percent haircut along the way so markets go up and markets go down and that was 60 years from 1959 to 1975 there's virtually no return in stocks. Now, the good people at stock charts are being accommodated with me. I've just been too busy to, to work with the program, and I apologize to those guys over there for that. But one thing he's working on uh, is the Landry Light and the percent away from the 50 week closing high indicator, which is on the bottom. He called it pullback, but it's actually should be a 50 week closing high. And when this thing gets above, this is the 10% line. When it goes above the 10% line, the market is in trouble. My thinking is if a market's going to lose 50% of its value, it's going to lose 10% of its value first. So once a market drops 10%, you need to think about getting out of the way. And that's just a simple little market timing system. The only other thing I require to help avoid some whipsaw is if the market is 10% or more away from its 50 week closing high and it closes below its 50 week moving average, which it did back in 2019, then you would exit the market. You would get back in when you are within 10% of the 50 week closing high and you have some Landry light to the upside, two weeks of Landry light to the upside. A little bit more stringent buy signal to help avoid being whipsawed and getting in too early. Now, Landry light just means you have two lows. In this case, we're looking for two lows greater than the moving average. This green below is green when you have upside Landry light, and it's red when you have downside Landry light. So here's the system, and when I designed this, my design, my intent was to avoid diaper change moments. Obviously, I did want to beat buy and hold as I've been preached, as I have preached many a times when talking about this system. But the main thing I wanted to avoid was huge drawdowns, such as the occasional 50% haircut that you get in the market. So this diaper change is how much further the market dropped after you exited the position. So you could see if you got in in 2003 and out of 2008, you made 48% return. And then obviously you gave up. It was actually more than 48% that you gave up a little bit of that because you're, time, you're timing the market. And the great thing is you avoided a 52% drop in the market afterwards, okay? And then you started buying along the way, starting in 2009. Now, we exited, or the system, I should say, exited on the 27th. There was a sell signal, okay? And I've got questions for the low of the move because we won't know what that low of the move is until we get the next buy signal. So simple little system, does okay. Uh, what's kind of cool is it would have kept you out of the market about 20% of the time. I'm fine with not being in the market. Now, the last little signal I showed you when it stopped out in, it was actually November of 2018, and that's when the guy said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't sell. Wish I'd have bought more. <laughs> it did drop 11% from that level. So let's say you had 
you were getting close to retirement, you had a million dollars saved up, and in about two or three weeks, you lost $110,000. That's a significant amount of money. That'll put, that'll mess with your psyche a little bit, right? So the bottom line is, and it's another one of those, look at me like I pooed my pants, but know that markets go up and know that markets go down. I can preach this until I'm blue in the face to people. And they'll look at me and roll my roll their eyes. Like, what the hell? Yeah, 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 whatever. But when markets start going down, they begin to freak out. So what I would suggest you do is first say, I accept the premise that markets go up and markets go down. And this is for the non-trader type who are watching today and the trader type who should know better. And once you accept the premise that markets go up and markets go down, decide what you're going to do about that. Well. You're going to be long if the market is generally going up and then you're going to be out of the way or maybe even short if the market is going down which brings us to the next point to short or not to short and i took this straight from trading full circle shorting is more difficult than it looks it looks pretty easy when you just see when you just see markets imploding you're like oh i can make money when stocks go down, I remember when I first discovered shorts. I'm like, wow, this is this is awesome. I can make money. My stocks are going down anyway. The ones I'm buying seem to be going down. I can make money as stocks go down. Well, I quickly found out that it's not quite that easy. One of the things I quickly discovered is it's tough to ride trends down due to sharp retrace rallies. You occasionally have some bottom fishers come in, and more importantly, you occasionally have some short covering come in and it'll squeeze you out of your position. And then of course the market will turn right back down. By market, I mean individual stocks. Now, one argument people give about shorting is you have 100% max profit. And that's true, but you could occasionally trade around positions, meaning that if you do get into a longer term trend on the short side, you'll have some pullbacks along the way. A lot of times you'll get like a witch hat type of pattern on the downside. I don't trade them on the upside, but on the downside, I like the witch's hat. And that's just a sharp retrace back up to like a pivot point. And when that occurs, you can add on to your position. And then when the market sells off hard, you can flip it out for a swing trade if it sells off hard, obviously. Some people will argue that there is a potential for unlimited losses and they're right, but you have to be stupid and you also have to be obstinate and you also have to have an unlimited amount of money. Because if you start losing a lot of money on the short side and it's more money or it's approaching the margin level required, your broker will kindly exit that position for you. So yes, it could potentially have, a short could potentially have an unlimited loss. By the way, what to short? I would rather short big, thick, huge cap stocks with hundreds of analysts and hundreds of institutions or thousands of institutions or thousands of analysts following them. I would much rather short something like that. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, might be priced for perfection. Everybody and their brothers in there, the crowded trade, I think that's one way of putting it, okay? Then I would some sort of small cap stock that we like to trade for the core methodology. So I'd much rather short a big cap stock, something that's a little bit more efficient Okay, because there's a lot of players that tend to cancel each other out, but they're all going to run for the door at the same time. I would avoid shorting something like a little biotech stock because you never know if tomorrow they come out with a cure for a coronavirus or whatever the case may be. There's also some logistics when it comes to shorts. You have to borrow stocks. You shorting, you borrow stock, you sell the stock, and then you've got to replace that stock at some point in time. He who sells what isn't his and must buy it back or go to prison, right? And occasionally they can call that stock away from you, meaning they can cancel out your position because let's say you borrowed stock from somebody, this is an oversimplification, but you borrowed it from somebody and then they sold their stock. Well, if you don't have any stock, if there's no stock to replace their stock, then they'll actually take your stock to replace it. So that's called a callback. That could muck up a perfectly good position. Whenever I get involved in a callback, I actually go out and 
buy puts. And I'm not doing that to be obstinate, but I'm thinking, you know what, I want to keep my position because I'm not stopped out. And I wonder, me being the slightly paranoid person that I am from being around this for years and years and years, as one trade I used to work with said, stocks don't move, they are moved. So I think there's possibly some manipulation out there. I don't want to go all conspiracy theory on you, but I don't see a callback as a sign that I need to get out of the stock. I see it as just it happens, something that happens, and then I'm going to replace those shares by being long puts. So I made the case that shorting is a big pain in the ass, and it is. But you have to you have to love the trend you're in. One example I used to give is back when I was heavily into my sailboat racing days, if we had the sailmaker on board, obviously we had a little bit of an edge, but in light, light air, we had a really good edge because everybody's attitude would just go to shit in light air. I mean, it's hot, you're miserable, sometimes there's bugs, you're drifting around, you're baking, it just sucks. And, you know, the boat wobbles around a lot and just, bleh, it's just nasty. But the sailmaker would tell everyone, everybody chill the F out. Love light air and it'll love you. And he would start tweaking things. He would get everybody to settle down. It's like, stop moving around so much. You know, somebody pass out sandwiches or beers or Cokes or whatever. Y'all stop going, moving around, going get Cokes and all that other crap. And slowly but surely, he would get the move, boat moving. Not by much, but enough to where we were at least moving and began to become very competitive again. So love light air, love you, love the trend that you're in. I'm fascinated with markets movements. One thing I was thinking about yesterday when I was doing my presentation for stock charts is that I'm just fascinated with market movements and it's like, yeah, they might suck. It's like, oh, I think I'm going to throw up. I just lost another 10 grand. Boy, that was fast. But look how fast this market is moving. This is freaking awesome. So you have to learn to love the trend you're in, learn to be fascinated with the market's movements, and just make sure you don't become that deer in the headlights. Now, getting back to the shorting, it's obviously the only way to make money in a down market. But the main reason, as I preach ad nauseum, is it helps you to see both sides of the market. I guarantee you, my friends who are coming out of the woodwork and these people who are emailing me that are freaking out, I guarantee you, if they shorted stocks, okay, and were willing to short stocks, they would be able to see both sides of the market, the upside and the downside, for instance, right now, we'll, we'll take a look at it in just one second, but like Apple has the bow tie down. No guarantee that's the ultimate top, but it could be. The S&P 500 on a daily basis has a bow tie down. NASDAQ bow tie down. All these indices have bow ties down from all-time highs, with the exception of the Russell, because it never did make it to all-time highs. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you're long-only oriented, you're going to see the market as glass half full. And as I often say, and I'm not trying to throw any of my friends under the bus, but I have friends that run hundreds of millions of dollars. And just because the way their charter is set up, not because of their own preference or whatever thing or whatever, but they're long only oriented. It, it just makes life a lot easier. There's some complications involved with shorting and, and such. And they always seem to see the market as glass half full. And a lot of times they're right because as a general statement, markets tend to go up more than they go down. It's a dangerous thing to trade off of, okay, or invest off of, but they do. But occasionally they drop, and when they drop, they can drop really quick, as you know. So anyway, if you're not playing both sides of the market, you'll tend to have a bias for the long side, and that's what gets a lot of people in trouble. Yeah, markets go up and markets go down, but that's fine and dandy until what? Markets start going down. So this, all of this shorting stuff I put in last minute because I was thinking like, how do we, how do we solve for this problem of people not doing the right thing and freaking out when the market goes down? Well, one, accept the premise that markets go up and markets go down. Duh, again, applied. But more importantly, learn how to short the market so you'll see the sell signals when they occur. And I think that shorting will 
stop you from becoming the proverbial deer in the headlights. All right, so lately I've been talking a lot about having the short-term trading pay for the longer-term trading. In other words, taking partial profits, trailing a stop, riding out trends for hopefully a long, long, long time. Well, one thing that I've talked about a lot lately is that as a trend follower, and I'm borrowing a line from the Fortune's Formula book, which was a good book, but be damn careful if you even think about using the Kelly formula. Kelly formula is based on the fact that statistics work in the market and markets simply aren't normally distributed. If you knew you had an edge in the market and you were a thousand percent sure that you would always have that edge and that edge would work out, then by all means, sell the form and put all the money into the market. Unfortunately, as you'll learn quickly in this business, markets are not normally distributed. There's a lot more fat tails that occur than should occur. A market shouldn't lose half its value every so many years, but it does, okay? These anomalies occur quite often, and they're not, they're a little bit more than an anomaly. It's like, I, I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but it's like, uh, <laughs> I know someone who works for Musk, and uh, it helps them launch rockets, and uh, he says when they blow up, they call them an, an anomaly. He says, well, where I'm from, it's out of Louisiana, we call that... <laughs> We call that an explosion, you know? <laughs> so these explosions occasionally happen. Now, as I said last week, when the market began to sell off a little bit a couple of weeks ago, you can't argue that, well, I should have gotten out then because that's just normal ebb and flow. I mean, go back and look at January, December, October, November, you know, Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, go back in time and look at these zigs and zags in the markets. You can't argue that a little bit of a drop, a little tiny drop like we had right before this thing imploded that you would have gotten out. But the next question, when you have that, oh shit, on the following day, the big gap down, the question is, should you exit all your positions? And I'm going to say no. And I believe in following the plan. Now, this is all the positions sans the AUY, which I did not have in this particular account for whatever reason. But we'll look at that one too. And that's just one account. And this is about 100K in this account. This is a, the, what's becoming my 100K model. So let's take a look at those stocks since the day after the first, after the market began to sell off. So ARQT actually went up 10 cents since then. So that's a $40 move. If you take a look at BRBR, that one stopped out. So that's $1.89 cents. To the downside, 800 shares, that's a $1,512 loss. And now in this particular case, and my slides are messed up, my apology, my animation didn't work out. But this Q trade is actually up $876. And you might say, well, Dave, that had a stop that got hit. Well, we came into the market and we had one of these, oh shoot type of moments where this thing is gapping down really hard. So you do, there was a better than average chance you were gonna get hit on the open. So that's where I applied a little bit of discretion in that particular example. So KOD had a little bit of a rally since the 24th for a gain on 200 shares of $1,748. Made an 8.74 move to the upside. Now let's see if we've given up a little bit of that today. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's down a couple of bucks a day. Now, O-N-N-E-M stopped out. It dropped five points from, and actually this number is a little bit smaller because this is the original trade, but I'll show you the spreadsheet towards the end. But we did have a loss on that one and it did stop out. So you have to get out the way. The ping trade went from 26 down to 23. So that's a $900 loss. I know you think, you're probably thinking, I want to trade with this guy, huh? PLMR actually went down a little bit. So that's a 386 loss. And then AUI stopped out for from the peak that it made, which happened to be right at around the 24th. So that was a 1470 loss on that one. So where does all this leave us? Well, it leaves us with a loss, or leaves me with a loss, <laughs> of $4,100. And that's just in this one model account. So it's, I don't want to make it look like this is easy, okay? Because I added up all my losses, and we were driving down the road, 
and I didn't tell my wife. She's like, well, you're awfully quiet today, which is unusual for me. And I was looking over the car dealership and it's like, you know, I could have bought one of those brand new cars with the amount of money I've lost last week. So it does suck when it happens. Make no bones about it. Now, my whole point here is not to cut and run when things began to go awry. And my hope, and I know you should never use the word hope, my hope is that one or two of these positions takes off. The ones that are in white have stopped out. And even with a little discretion, they've completely stopped out. There's no, I'm no longer in those trades. But hopefully one or two of these stocks headed higher will erase the losses from following the original plan. The point I'm trying to make is I know a lot of people have cut and run. And that's fine. And that might be the thing to do this time. But longer term, you're going to miss out. If one of these stocks decides to skyrocket, you're going to be a hurt and pop. And without that big winner, it could change your whole year. Now, there's no guarantee. You can only lose so much per trade. But as a general statement, most of the time, if you're, let's say you're risking 2% on an account, which comes to about $2,000 on around 100K account, most of the time you'll get stopped out and it won't gap through the stop. And it can gap through stock and you stop and you lose a little more. But the point I'm trying to make here is that losses or limited or at least somewhat limited because we are going to get out at the stop and if the stop gets exceeded through a gap but gains are potentially unlimited so again you know maybe hope but hopefully one of these will take off or two of these or more so that's a pretty substantial loss especially if you add it up in multiple accounts but it happens now, some random thoughts left over, some left over from last week and surviving a drawdown. If it were easy, everyone would be doing it, right? I would urge you to stick with the plan. And, you know, I'm kind of anxious to see how this thing's going to come out the other side. So I had all these positions coming in, and I want to see what's going to happen just by following my plan to see how it all turns out in the end. And, and I hope, and I know there's a word again, but I hope that one or two of these takes off and I make back all that money and then some, and I give you a great example or provides you a great example of just following the plan. Even if it doesn't work, longer term, following the plan is the thing to do. Now, open profits are getting decimated, especially from a pre-sell off area. So that $4,000 number, believe me, that's where buying the car came in to my mind and middly monetizing is a very dangerous thing to do, but we're all guilty of that. We know that. You just have to recognize when you're doing it and not play that game. So open drawdowns suck, but again, you never know which position could turn into the mother of all winners. Now, this is a hypothetical, I suppose, but it's like I was long a little coronavirus stock, got long before the coronavirus scare came into play. And unfortunately, I got stopped out of the stock, but on subsequent days, it rallied about 50 points. Well, do the math in your head, 50 points, let's say you just had 1,000 shares, that's $50,000. <laughs> that's a lot of money. So just one big winner will pay for it all, as Ed Sakota once said. He actually sings it. He has uh, the Whipsaw song. Maybe listen to the Whipsaw song might be the solution for my troubled friends. So let's see how the dust settles with all this. It could suggest that micromanagement pays, and I see, I've see i seen a lot of people just get out the way, and I'm not a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of following the plan and see what happens. I did go back in time and looked at some drawdown presentations I've done in the past, and in one of them, the portfolio had a couple of losers in it and a couple of small winners, and it was up about 500 bucks, certainly nothing to brag about. Got a lot of people emailing me saying, Dave, let's just shut her down. Doesn't look too good. And I'm like, no, you know, let's just play it out and see what happens. And then over the coming weeks, it went from being up just $500 to actually up over $5,000. Now that won't always happen. 
and this might be a case where it didn't happen, but longer term, following a plan is a thing to do. One of my problems is I tend to look at the equity, meaning how much I've made a loss on the trade to determine, hey, am I getting close to that profit target? Or hey, am I getting close to that protective stop? The better thing to do, which causes a hell of a lot less angst for me, is to just look at the charts because sometimes a chart will pull back and look still look pretty good. But if you're looking at how much equity you lost, it could mess with your psyche. It's kind of like don't think about elephants, right? You can't get it out of your head. Now, opening gap reversals, or as we call them, ogres now, they really haven't paid off lately, but I haven't given up on them completely just yet. Luckily, the few that I've gone after recently have not triggered, and I've been a little bit more, what's the word, selective and picking them. And you gotta be careful when the market's sliding like it is to try to jump in and mitigate the damages or try to hedge, which is a bad idea. But I think if you wait and wait and wait and wait, and that's why I put out that post a while back in Facebook, trading is so dang easy when I just wait and wait and wait. And then I go in and do the Jimmy Rogers trade, as I often say, beat the dead horse on that, right? wait until there's money lying in the corner. All I have to do is walk over there and pick it up. In the meantime, I do nothing. Well, I need to get back to that mode with the opening gap reversals. And I think I'm there now. I get my ass handed to me for trading these opening gap reversals. And then when I go back and look at it, I realize that, and in, in, you know, I thought there'd be one presentation where I wouldn't quote Sakota and Rogers, but I guess this won't be it. But I go back and look at these opening gap reversals where I lose a lot of money on them. And I'm like, you know what? I, that was definitely into wishing meaning trying to make something happen versus intuition. I've said that so many times, people start to quote me as saying that. No, that's Ed Sakota who said that. You know, one thing I've really been thinking about, and, and there's actually psychological proof of this. If you read a, a little bit of Dr. Robert Mara, he wrote a book called Mastering Fear, which I'd recommend you read. And I need to reread -read that one. It's a little short one. But he also did one called The Kaizen Way, which is a fantastic book. A lot of things, it's not a trading book, but a lot of things will flow over into trading. And when I saw him speak, he was speaking at a conference that I was speaking at, oh geez, probably about five years ago. And he said some really interesting things. And basically he was saying that we need one another. And he went into details as to how that works. So it's very important to have some sort of support mechanism as a trader because trading is a very lonely sport and you'll feel really abnormal a lot of times especially when you're losing money and if not that misery loves company but if you could interact with other people it'll make you feel a lot more normal and that's I'm I'm really stoked at how well my Facebook group has has taken off I never dreamed it would I thought I would just go in every day and say, hey, this is what's going on, and uh, maybe get one or two comments, and that would be it, and people would wait 24 hours for me to come in and say something else. But you guys have really raised the bar on this thing and doing a lot of interacting, and you know, uh, Jim Freeman in here I was just talking with earlier, he, he does some really cool market timing. He looks at a lot of short-term, like hourly and half-hour charts, and, and you know, he was calling his top long before it ever happened. Now, he's going to get whipsawed here and there, but it is kind of cool to see these signals and be reminded, that, not that I don't look at the hourly signals, because I do, but sometimes I need a little nudge or a reminder, and it's kind of like this collegial nature of this group. It's like we're all helping each other out. I'm actually getting private messages from people like, you know, these guys are a little bit, they're risking a little too much or whatever. Dave, can you have a talk with them? I'm like, okay, yeah, we might need to talk to some of these guys that are over trading and such. Anyway, the group is free, but you have to be a gold member of DaveLander.com, and that keeps the riffraff out. I turned down, I'm not going to say dozens, but a lot of people, and you just have to be a gold member. That's it. And that just keeps the riffraff out. So in the group, you know, you can interact with other traders. You can ask for help. A lot of times, and you guys, I want to thank you for this, who are in the group, have answered a lot of the questions. I do a Q&A session every now and then. And I had them regularly scheduled, but now I just do them when the, when I get enough questions to accumulate because most of the questions are answered within the group. And you know, if you're struggling 
ask for help. You know, we all have to start somewhere. And the other thing, like I said, you'll get to see the signs and the signals as they occur because we're all following this stuff and pointing it out. I'll give you a case in point. Last year, somebody pointed out we had a buy signal in the TFM 10% system, my own system. And I'm like, no, 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 there's no way it's a buy because I was still kind of bearish at the time. And then lo and behold, I looked at it and realized that, holy crap, it is a buy signal. I didn't even realize that. So a lot of good things like that come out of it. And I know I'm kind of biased here. And you can follow along with a lot of trades like the opening gap reversals. I'll throw out, if I think it's a decent looking opening gap reversal, I'll throw it out. I'll comment on the ones that you guys are throwing out sometimes. And then we now have, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but it's the $4 million challenge of a small account. And I need to run it into 4 million. But instead of telling you that I did this, allegedly in hindsight, as some of these guys do, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do ahead of time, and then we'll see how it works. And we were off to a spectacular start, and then we stumbled with this little market slide, but let's see what happens. So if you're not a gold member, here are a couple of links you can go to. You can start for free and start to poke around a little bit, but I would encourage you to become a gold member, obviously. All right, let's get to the live charts. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks feel free to do so now any comments thoughts i'm using anecdotes on anything that we've talked about so far let's take a look at the s p 500 and then let's take a look at most everything else which looks pretty much just like the s p 500 and we'll also take a look at the nasdaq too so we have a bow tie down, as you can plainly see here, okay? Now, the other night I was recommending a short in the service and I said it was a bow tie and a first thrust and somebody said, Dave, I don't get it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a bow tie. And they were right. I just assumed that everything had bow tied down. But the, the thing is, just it's just semantics in a case like this. When the market drops this hard, this fast, it's a first thrust, and a lot of times that bow tie gets forced to happen, okay? The, the, the designer's intent of the bow tie was to catch a gradual rollover in the overall market. So you think, well, the market's pretty good. It's not too far away from all-time highs. But then you look and see, well, wait a minute. This thing hasn't made much forward progress in a while, and there's a bow tie sell signal. It's like, oh, okay as opposed to this forced bow tie, which, ha which happens when the market begins to implode like it did. So we do have a bow tie. I guess an aggressive entry would be below the lows as they go higher. So technically it would trigger, would have triggered this morning. If you were trading that signal, I would use a little bit more liberal entry, maybe about right here or so on that. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Same sort of action going on in the NASDAQ. We have a bow tie down, okay? So this could be the beginning of the end. As I've been saying, the main thing to watch for, and let's see if we can get a, let's go back to the P's just because it's well watched. And this is the point I was trying to make and hopefully I made in my little market update that I did. So we had the big slide, obviously. So we're up here at all time highs. Everybody's feeling pretty good. My little buddy from Mississippi. I'm making 1K a day in my 401K. Okay. <laughs> now he this morning he texted me a, a video of a roller coaster. <laughs> I'm not making fun of him. I'm just saying, you know, it happens. So we had this big old slide here. So this is the thrust down, obviously. And then now we're in the retrace. Now it's what happens next that's important, right? So you had the retrace rally. And like I wrote in a little article, does it go up or does it go down? Well, the trader play would be to play the downside, but only on an entry, which would be triggering now for the aggressive and maybe a little bit later for the less aggressive. And that's the important thing to watch. I mean, at, at any rate, it's it's bumpy in here, right? But so far, it's kind of unfolding in a, I wouldn't say a textbook manner, but a somewhat textbook manner in here. So watch this retrace rally. Ideally, I'd love, you know, here's the thing. I short and people sometimes get mad at me because I short or oh, you're always bearish. It's like, well, no, the market's going down. So I have to be bearish. I'm a trend falling moron. I'm not outsmarting the market or being a pessimist. I mean, shit, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, right? 
GHT, Stephen Wright. Anyway, let's say the market did magically go all the way back up, which I'm hoping it does, right? Okay. Well, one big concern here is by the time you get all the way back to new highs, <laughs> shit is flying in here. By the time you get all the way back to new highs, the market is very, very, very overbought. You will have some people looking to get out of break even. You will have some shorts that are thinking, hey, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and pile on this thing. So a lot of things will happen if you have that big old V-shaped recovery. Now, a couple of other random thoughts in my head, I think, and I haven't done the studies on this, I think I just have gone off of other people's studies or seem to remember other studies, that election year, and I guess the incumbent is has power to help manipulate the markets, but election years tend to be positive years. If somebody want to do a study on that or do a Google on it and let me know. So I'm wondering if there's going to be some potential or more, I should say, manipulation to try to get this market higher. We did have the Fed cut rates, which was good for a slight rally in the morning, and then the market came back in. Okay, yeah, we'll get to those questions. Good questions. Well, since gold, it's the next one up. Craig wants to talk about gold versus the dollar. Well, gold is dollar denominated, okay? So you just have to look at gold in and of itself. So gold is headed higher. The dollar, there's something wrong with the dollar in this IntelliChart. It looks a little different elsewhere. But let's assume the recent chart is correct. So dollar has been headed down. As the dollar goes down, it takes more and more dollars to what? Buy gold. So gold is having a decent little rally in here. Gold kind of sucks because it knocked us out of our gold positions and then it turned around and went right back up. Well, it happens. Before I forget, let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty has bow tied down. It's not off of all time highs. Your all time bow tie was back here. And then we had a pretty serious slide from that, as you can see. So that was nothing to sneeze at. If you were trading this ETF or if you were holding on to a bunch of small cap stocks back in December of 19. That was pretty ugly. But now we have a bow tie down. What's concerning is we took out or we pushed through all of this support here. Okay. You're still in AUR. Well, you would wonder that was complaining about AUR. Did you follow your plan? Should you still be long AUR? <laughs> so, Craig, yeah, gold is uh is looking better again. It's not too far right here. If it closes, it's closing at multi-year highs. So that's certainly a good thing, okay? If you're a gold bug, gold bull. So we could see some buy side setups again soon in gold. As you go through these sectors, there's kind of no place to run, no place to hide. Metals and mining overall, as you can see, downtrend. With a few exceptions, gold stocks coming right back here, roaring back, okay? Now, that would have been a good example. I was thinking about that earlier today when I was getting ready to go live. These, the AUI stopped out, but it would have been a great example of why we st stick to positions. I know it's, I'm talking about all these hypotheticals. But if the AUI would have not stopped out and gold goes on to make new highs, that would have been a great example of following the plan. Silver doesn't look quite as good as gold. You can see it looks like a top is in place with silver. You know, I, I'd hate to try to play that game, but maybe short silver and go long gold. You know, that might be a that might be a play. Consumer non-durables really not doing that great. You would think that consumer non-durables would get a bit of a bid given the news and all, but so far, nope. And as you go through these, even the foods, you would think, hey, you know, people still need food in the bear market, but foods are looking pretty ugly in here. Banks have been in a slide. Banks were in a slide long before this happened, but you can see they're banging out new lows with vigor. Insurance not looking so hot in here. We have an insurance stock as a possible short today. Real estate not looking too good. And that's in spite of bonds banging out some new highs in here. By the way, keep an eye on bonds. If they gap to all-time highs and start coming back in, maybe take a look at, is it TMF or TMV? 
TMF. Which one goes down? No, TMV. Take a look at TMV, okay? So TMV gaps to all-time lows, then TMV might be a good opening gap reversal type of play, okay? For the little bit more advanced trader. But as you go through all these sectors, even like health services, you think would be doing pretty good given this coronavirus scare. Biotech has actually done okay. Now, I'm kind of a bull in biotech and I'm not a bull, I'm not a perma bull. I just, I know I'm long a couple of them and that might give me a little bit of bias. I gotta be careful of that. But in general, there are some isolated stocks in biotech that are occasionally doubling overnight and more like the little coronavirus stock that I just missed. Boy, it's always, you're always that close, right? Going up 50 points. So there is, biotech's doing pretty good, especially on a relative strength basis. Now, I don't believe in relative strength trading in and of itself, but it is kind of interesting to, to note that the biotech stocks are really hanging in there. Health service stocks, not so much. As I just said, bow tied down, big retrace. And then defense and manufacturing, and then the home builders and material construction overall. Pretty much all of these areas look like the overall market itself. So nothing earth shattering here. Apple, or as some people call it, computer hardware. And I make that kind of joke because most of the computer hardware, Apple is so big, Apple makes a big component of it. Computer software, you need software if you got hardware, right? Big bow tie down. So I know I shouldn't bore you and go through all of these, but I guess it's too late. Semiconductors, bow tie down. We have a semiconductor on our radar as a short. But here's the deal. There are a plethora of shorts, and I've got a plethora of orders in right now. Actually, just a few, so it's not a plethora, but it's, I had a few orders in. I don't want them all to trigger at once. I'd like to kind of get short a couple of stocks. Let's see what happens and then get short some more. The problem is... And I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but the problem with the short side, another problem with the short side is, let's say you're looking at four or five longs that you really, really like. Well, you might put in orders and it might take weeks for those orders to fill and four or five weeks down the road, you're long four or five stocks. And usually that's okay because the market obviously went higher for all of those to trigger and things are doing okay. The short side, it's like everybody rushes through the door at the same time. So it's like, if you're looking at five shorts, you decide to go out to five shorts, you get short those five shorts all at once, all within the same five minutes. And then, you know, big retrace rally comes along and kind of mucks up your position. So big no bones about it. Again, shorting is not an easy thing to do. And I much rather the long side. If you can't short, would you suggest going long and adverse ETF? As a general statement, I would say no. All inverse ETFs will eventually go to zero, okay? So over the short term, I would say maybe, but longer term, I just pulled up a random one here, SPXS. Where was SPXS? It was at 8,175. And now where is it? It's at $15. But Dave, that's not zero. Well, what happens is when they get really low, they reverse split them. So if you, you think, oh, I'm just going to buy one of these inverse ETFs and sit on it. Well, they're going to reverse split you to death. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend, hold, recommend holding these overnight. What happens is they're forced to short at lower levels. And they're also forced to they their goal is to to track the like the day change, the one day change, okay? And it's not like they're 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 looking at the s and p for three months and trying to match the three month performance. So if you got in one of these and then the market tanked for the next three months, you might actually not even make money because they're not trying to mass that performance or not, or match that performance, I should say. They're trying to just match the day, the daily change, the one day change, and that doesn't work out longer term. And you could experiment a little bit with the math on that to wrap your head around it. So I wouldn't recommend any inverse ETFs, especially leverage inverse ETFs to be held overnight. So. 
I mean, if you want to take a small position in something, that's fine. I do it on a non-leverage ETF. Is it was like TWM maybe or something? You know, I don't know. But longer term, they're all going to go to zero. Okay. All right. That stock. Did I recommend that stock? Why does it sound familiar? We'll take a look at it anyway. ADRO. Yeah, this one was recommended recently. It was on my Landry list. I liked it, but I didn't go with it as an official recommendation because the HV is kind of ridiculous. I can kind of pick it apart. It has, eh, it does have a little overhead supply to deal with and all. But yeah, in general, I think it looks pretty good. It's headed in which direction? It's headed mostly in the right direction. Um, I don't think I would put on a new position here, but if you're long, as I'm guessing you already are, then by all means, yes, yeah, stay long. I had to get my stop at break even so I didn't get hit. Okay, an AUI. Well, yeah, I think we had to stop a little bit higher on that one. Thank you, Frenchie. I'm not supposed to listen to the news, but a half a basis point from the Fed begs gold. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, what? What? let's take a look at that. A, when did they... they cut the rate let's take a look at the p's spy so they cut the rate on this day here by the way uh connor's used to do a lot of news stuff and one thing he talked about was big picture news as opposed to like intraday news reversal so the system there is when the i think it's like when you takes out the close. So let's say there's a close there, three, two. There's your news day. When that close gets taken out, you would go short. So I guess bigger picture wise, even though we did have a rally today, we're back below that news day close, okay? The day before the news day close. So I think his point was big picture news reversals. I mean, you know, they always make it tough on you, right? His point was this. That okay, well, let's say here's your day before your news day, and then if it let's say it rallied the next day like this, okay, well, then when it takes out this close, you would go short. And a few years back, I pointed out somebody asked me, you know, Steve Jobs not doing so good, what do you do? And I was like, well, look at where Apple is the day before he dies. Or, you know, after, after you pass, unfortunately, you know, not to make light of that, but like, what do you do? I was asking a question, so I answered it. I said, well, after he passes, see where the stock is, okay, the day before. And when that close gets taken out, buy Apple, okay? So that's the point there. And I think this kind of big picture news reversal is working against us right now because the, the market doesn't care that they – cut the rate a half percent. So anyway, what what was I trying, what was I doing before? I was trying to figure out where the news day was. So that was what, let's see. So that was what, on the third. So you could see gold, yeah, gold did rally on that. Unfortunately, we got knocked out of AUI a couple days earlier, which, you know, sucks. TBT, yeah, TBT is going to be the opposite of bonds. I wouldn't hold it. I wouldn't hold it longer term, though. That's the only problem with something like that. What I would do is I would go after again. I'd go after TMF. Okay. I'm sorry, TMV. TMV. By the way, I just a random thought. I I did try to short a while back just for shits and giggles to see if I could get a couple hundred shares off just for fun. I wanted to short an inverse ETF, which means I'd be bullish on the underlying whatever. And my brokerage wouldn't let me do it. So y'all let me know if you've ever tried to short an inverse ETF. I think that would be an interesting strategy because in general, you'd have the you'd have the market working in your favor. I mean, for instance, this TMV. What does TMV do? longer term it goes where it goes down why 
all inverse ETFs will eventually go to zero. Write that down. Okay. Unfortunately, they don't let you short them, or at least I haven't been able to short them. But if anybody figures out if you can short them, let me know. I'd appreciate that. I'll give you a high five. Yeah, so if you come in tomorrow and this TMV is way down here somewhere, then by all means, look to play that opening gap reversal. Well, you're up 23% on AUI. Well, if you violated rules, then the market has taught you to do the wrong thing. But if you had a plan in place and followed your plan, then good job. Travel stocks are getting creamed. I would imagine so. You have any in particular in mind? Is it uh, CCL maybe? Is, is that Carnival? Yeah, man, you know, I, I took two cruises in my life, first and last, but I wouldn't be in a, <laughs> I wouldn't be in a big hurry to take a cruise, at least not right now. But yeah, it's obviously looking pretty ugly in the CCL. And I'm sure plenty others. A L L E for Chris is a short. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> Got a friend of mine. Hey man, yeah, man. He says, man. He says that a lot. And he says, that's badass, man. That's a badass looking pattern, man. Yeah, man, you got a, no, I'm saying, man, you got a nice thrust lower. You got a retrace up. You got a pretty good size volume on this. You don't want to short something with a a, a boatload of, uh, I'm sorry, that's thin in volume because you could get in trouble. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, that looks good. There's Now, keep in mind that, a lot of stocks look like that. I have, I filled the whole legal page with tickers or at least a column on a legal page or two columns, a legal page. What I'm looking at now, that's what I knocked over a minute ago. And I've got like two columns of stocks on the short side. So it's like 50 stocks that are possible setups. And that's after whittling them down quite a bit. So there's a lot of stocks that'll look like this. You know, that's the problem. They're all going to go with the overall market. Yeah, INFO, that's another one. Good thing here is lots and lots and lots and lots of volume. Okay, so you should be able to get a short off. But yeah, that looks great. Okay, that's the kind of short you want. You don't want some short way down here scraping bottom. Okay, you want something coming off the highs like that. And that looks good. Okay, now don't rush out and short a biotech, right? I'll show you why not. Okay, look at that. Okay. Look at that move. That's huge. This is the one that I was long down here at 20 bucks, and then I went to 70. And I dropped an F-bomb or two, maybe three. <laughs> LOL, you're right. Everything is a first thrust. You have to be careful. Yeah, you know, and it's all going to, that's the problem. Everything goes at the same time. You know, it's like you almost feel like you need a little exposure to the overall market. But, you know, that's a that's a tricky game. That's a tough thing to do. But right now, that looks like the side you want to be on, at least for now. And again, we really hadn't had the fantastic opening gap reversals lately. I did violate my rules. I think on the Fed day, I did end up going long or short, I should say, long the SPXS. I might have done a little bit, did okay on that, but not fantastic. But yeah, it's, it hasn't been an easy market as of late, in case you're wondering. And that's the other thing of having a group of traders together is that we can talk about it. it's like hey you know am i the only one getting my ass handed to me out here <laughs> you know and it does you know it's very important to keep your mind in this business because it's it's pretty easy to lose it and so i think that's why we need to turn to each other for support donald says i filled out a trade ticket of fidelity for a short on spxs and nothing indicates that they won't accept the order yeah, but click into it, okay? Actually make an order, you know, do a hundred, well, you know, if I don't want to, I don't want you to lose money or anything, but if you want to do a hundred shares or something, SPX, S, uh, let's see. Well, I don't want to, I don't want you to lose money. I mean, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll take the order, but they won't place the order, I don't think. Nice little trend there. All right, any additional, any other questions, any stocks you guys wanna look at, anything you wanna talk about? You have me here, We've got a few minutes left. While we're in impasse, obviously I wanna thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. 
looks like some people are starting to find the show again so i'm excited about that if there's if you are having trouble finding the show if you're watching recording let me know and we could we could try to figure that out i don't know what happened seems like there's a disconnect from a while back where everybody would show up and then now it's like we're not getting as many people as we used to so we got to figure it out all right going once going twice all right thanks everyone everybody enjoy your weekend and you guys that are in the Facebook group, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much.